Good evening, and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know. I'm Mary Cranston, past chair of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors, and the retired senior partner of Pillsbury Winthrop uh, Shaw Pittman, a law firm, and your chair tonight. Uh, you can find us on the internet at commonwealthclub.org or download your iPhone and Android app for program and schedule information and podcasts of past programs. And now, on to today's program. Exactly one year ago today, on June 26, 2013, the Supreme Court of the United States issued a pair of landmark decisions, striking down the Defense of Marriage Act and eliminating California's discriminatory Proposition 8, reinstating the freedom to marry for gays and lesbians in California, and in turn set off a chain reaction for marriage equality throughout the United States. Tonight, we will meet the two attorneys who won that case, and we will commemorate the Supreme Court's decision and discuss its impact going forward. To introduce tonight's distinguished speakers and our distinguished moderator, it is my great pleasure to introduce a man who is actively campaigning for gay rights and marriage equality. Tonight, he is not here as Mr. Sulu or any other character. <laughs> but as himself. Actor-activist George Takei and his husband Brad Takei have been married. George and Brad have been married since September 2008, prior to Prop 8 taking effect in California. They remain committed to fighting for human rights and ending anti-gay bullying. Please welcome George Takei. Oh my. <laughs> California. Hawaii, Connecticut, the District of Columbia, Illinois, Iowa, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, these and 12 other states now have marriage equality. <laughs> 16 countries have laws that allow same-sex marriage or domestic partnerships. And in this country, a number of states are now awaiting appellate court judg judgments yet to come. There is indeed change afoot in the political and social climate of this country. Tonight, I'm so proud to introduce the two attorneys who joined forces to win a Supreme Court decision that has indeed altered the American landscape forever. They have also written the new book, Redeeming the Dream, about that landmark decision and the future of marriage equality in the United States. David Boyce and Ted Olson have been called America's legal odd couple. <laughs> Their pairing is certainly the most unlikely in civil rights history. David Boyce, a Democrat, Ted Olson, a Republican, vigorously faced each other in the Bush versus Gore case in 2000, and later came together because they decided human rights were more important than partisanship. Both gentlemen have made Time Magazine's list of the world's most influential people, and both are highly regarded litigators. David Boyce is chairman of Boyce, Schiller, and Flexner, a law firm with offices in New York, Washington, D.C., California, Florida, Nevada, and New Hampshire. His credentials include serving as chief counsel for the U.S. Jud Judiciary Committee, counsel to the FDIC, and special counsel for the U.S. Department of Justice. He holds a law degree from Yale. Theodore Ted Olson is a partner in the law firm of Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher's Washington, D.C. office. He has served as Solicitor General of the United States, 
was Assistant General Attorney in the U.S. Department of Justice and private counsel to Presidents Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush. Mr. Olson received his law degree from the University of California at Berkeley. Tonight they will be in conversation with another individual who doesn't sample the political climate before taking a principled stand. <laughs> Gavin. <laughs> Gavin Newsom is California's 49th Lieutenant Governor and the former twice elected mayor of San Francisco. In 2004, after only 36 days as a mayor, Mr. Newsom gained worldwide attention by granting marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Those marriages were later annulled by the California Supreme Court, paving the way for Proposition 8's adoption by voters in 2008, and its defeat before the highest court in the land exactly one year ago today. Welcome to 2014. <laughs> and now please welcome David Boyce, Tav Ted Olson, and Gavin Newsom. Thank you, George. Thank you. And thanks to all of you. Thank you to everybody for uh, taking the time out to, to be here, and uh, in particular thanks to whoever the hell scheduled this one year to the day. Uh, they deserve a raise, uh, whoever's, whoever's listening. Pride Week. San Francisco. Remarkable how far we've come, as George was reminding us. Ted and David, thank you both for uh, taking the time out of a book tour. I've seen you on the Colbert Report. I've seen you. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it didn't go well for me when I was on there. So congrats. Uh, Charlie Rose, hell, you've been everywhere in the last uh, uh, nine or ten days or so, and I know you're off to L.A. tomorrow, and uh, we're very grateful you took the time to, to stop here. And I've, I've watched some of the interviews, I've listened to them, and you know, everyone talks, I think, uh, quite lovingly about this relationship, this notion of an odd couple. But seriously, I mean, after Bush v. Gore, uh, there was no way you guys were sort of hanging out on the golf course uh, a year or two later. I mean, how did it come about that you started to repair, to the extent that I'm not overstating it, a relationship, if not between the two of you, between your friends and allies and supporters, that I imagine had some deep-seated animus and developed a lot of resentment around that case on both sides. Um, how did you begin to repair that relationship, to create the conditions where you were in a position, Ted, to make that phone call to David to include him in this process? Well, we were opponents, but not en enemies. Um, I watched David work and his representation of Vice President Gore and the team that he led. I had great admiration for what they did how they did it, and who they were representing. Um, and we engaged with one another because we often had to make speeches or appear on television and explain our client's yeah, point of view. Of course, yeah. And these were contentious times, of course. It was a very, very intense five-week period. Uh, and, it, and it extended beyond that because it tore the, peop the, the, the country up a little bit. Um, it's something that, that contentious. I figured it was among the three most contentious presidential elections in history. After the election was over, uh, I was nominated by President Bush to be Solicitor General of the United States. And I wasn't the most popular person among the Democrats in the United States Senate. <laughs> so the process of the confirmation, which is never pretty anyway, was going to be kind of um, contentious is a mild word. David volunteered to talk to his former boss, Senator Kennedy, and speak up for me uh, when I was finally confirmed by an overwhelming 51 to 47 vote. <laughs> <laughs> David came to my swearing in at the Justice Department. Uh, we got together on a few occasions the fall of that year. I won't spend too much time. Uh, our wives became um, Friends, um, we've done things together. We both enjoy um, the law. We really believe in the law. We believe in the process of the law. Uh, we may 
we, we agree that sometimes we'll disagree about decisions, but I think we have mutual respect. We, the law is a, is a blessing for us both. Uh, we've, we've enjoy fine wine, especially California wine, uh, in case any of you own a vineyard. Great. Uh, and we became, <laughs> we've tasted your wine, it's very good. Um, Served at both the Bush and Obama White House. Uh, we just became closer and closer together over the years. We enjoyed working with one another, and we always talked about, well, maybe there'll be a case where we could be on the same side. We were on opposite sides of other cases subsequent to this, but we kept looking for an opportunity, and I know you'll get to it, but um, we finally had this opportunity in the Prop 8 case, and maybe that we'll talk some more about that. But. In, in, I mean, is that an accurate reflection from your perspective? I mean, it, it, you better say it's accurate. Better say, I better say it now. I don't know all these people. <laughs> no, but it is. and. Um, We'd known each other a little bit um, before Bush v. Gore, but it was really during Bush v. Gore that we really became friends. Yeah. Um, you admire somebody who's on the other side who is a good lawyer and a person of integrity. And I respected the way Ted handled himself. Um, I disagreed with him then, I disagreed with him now <laughs> on that particular case. But um, I respected his role in the process. Uh, he was a fine advocate. Uh, for Governor Bush, and he was uh, a person who always handled himself with professionalism and integrity. And so when the time came afterwards, I had no hesitancy at all in telling my Democratic friends that this was a person who I thought would make a fine Solicitor General. And we became uh, closer friends over time. Um, we still haven't gotten on the golf course together, uh, but we do take bike trips with our wives. And we have uh, had several uh, bike trips in several different foreign countries. Um, we've done some sailing together. And so it, it, it's a genuine, I think, close friendship. And there are many issues that we disagree on, um, but there are a lot of issues that we have common views of. And what we found is that we can work together on those areas where we have common grounds. And I think each, each of us thinks that the country would be a better, more productive place if more people could focus on what we have in common and not where we, where we disagree. And anyone disagrees with that. So just briefly so we can move on to the, the guts of this. You're, you're with your sister-in-law at the time. Um, and uh, she's with uh, Rob Reiner, wife, Michelle, and they're having a conversation. Uh, and your sister-in-law at the time suggests they should call you. Is that accurate? Yes. Uh, Rob and Michelle Reiner, who are warriors, um, they put themselves passionately into the things that they believe in. They put their resources, their reputation. They felt that Proposition 8 was so wrong, so un-Californian, so un-American um, in its outcome, uh, that they, they were discussing at the Beverly Hills, the Polo Lounge in Beverly Not so many things have happened at the Polo Lounge in Beverly Hills. <laughs> um, that would be another book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But the Reiners were together with some very close friends talking about this, about how there should be a federal challenge to the constitutionality of Proposition 8. It seemed unconstitutional to them. And my ex-sister-in-law overheard them, and she said, um, you should, you should t if you're going to have a case in the United States Supreme Court that might go to the United States Supreme Court, you should talk to my ex-brother-in-law, Ted Olson. He's been there. He's handled cases in the Supreme Court. Um, you should think about him. Um, Rob Reiner said that what went through his mind is that she's just suggested that we hire the devil. <laughs> uh, and Michelle said, uh, said to Kate, are you brain dead? What, what are you <laughs> uh, it, but anyway, they thought about it and they thought maybe the chemistry of someone who's well known as a conservative, um, and had been a part of Republican administrations and had been in the Supreme Court, maybe that would be an idea. They, was con they sent someone to talk to me in Washington, and I said, having grown up in California, I was really disappointed in what I still regard as my fellow citizens. I still feel like I'm a Californian, although I've been away from a while. And I said, if we're going to do this, I would like to be involved in this. I'd like to do something. 
about Proposition 8. If we can do it right, we have to put the right resources into it. We have to be committed for the long term. This is not something that will be over in a few months. Um, and I ultimately suggested that because I might be suspect in the eyes of many people because of my background and being on the other side, people don't always understand that lawyers are representing clients, um, above, although I certainly was identified with Republican things. I thought it was very important uh, for the chemistry of it to bring in as a full partner uh, someone who had a reputation of being on the other side of the political spectrum. And I immediately thought of David. Uh, I thought the symbolism of, the, of, of our relationship coming together, friends who have been on opposite sides, the symbolism that it isn't Republican or Democrat, it's an American issue, it goes across the political spectrum, quit thinking about let, uh, conservatives or liberals, start thinking about human rights, start thinking about the Constitution. And I also thought that we could tr attract a lot of attention just because of the novelty of us coming together. And by attracting attention, we could give people an opportunity uh, to ask us why we were coming together, why we were doing this thing, and by doing that, speak to the American people as well as speaking to the judiciary, and that that would have a synergistic effect with the court case. And David, your immediate response was yes? My, 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 sort of my immediate thought? response was yes. Um, I, had, um, I had concluded before that call that this was really the defining civil rights issue of this particular quarter of the century. Um, I'm, I, I can't be here without thanking you. Um, as I write in the book, um, uh, my attention to this issue really arose in 2004. Um, like a lot of straight people, uh, I was vaguely in favor of gay rights, um, but I would never really thought about marriage. Yeah. And um, when you opened up uh, the clerk's office for marriage licenses, and I remember the images on television of people coming here from not only California, but all over the country and to some extent all over the world um, and standing in line. And they were so happy to have the opportunity to get married. And I remember talking to my wife, Mary, at the time, saying, what in the world are we doing um, depriving people of the ability to get married when it can make them so happy, it can be so meaningful to them, and it doesn't hurt anybody. What in the world are we doing? And uh, that was a, a moment for me that really changed my perspective. And so when Ted called me, uh, I immediately said yes. That's why. It's, and, and I, it begs the question, I was gonna ask you this, Ted, as well. I mean, you know, I have a father, a progressive judge, he was an activist judge before they coined the term, uh, and he was not supportive when we did what we did in 2004. In fact, uh, it took him years, even after Prop 8. Yeah. Uh, he kept saying, can't you call it something else? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I support gay rights, just call it something else. Um, Catholic, Irish background. Mm -hmm. Were you really there that early? I, mean, I was, in fact, someone reminded me when there was some commentary, what in the world is he doing? Um, conservatives were saying you're fighting for a new constitutional right. I didn't feel it was a new yeah. constitutional right. But David Frum, the journalist, said, Ted, I remember a dinner we had 10 years ago with your, with your then wife, my late wife, um, arguing about this, and it was three to one against you. Um, and that you were in favor of letting people, allowing people to get married and having that, right? Because my, my thinking is very much like David's. We did, never talked about it um, collectively, but two loving couples coming together uh, that want to form an enduring relationship and to become a part of a community and raising a family uh, and paying taxes and becoming a part of everybody else and making a unit of themselves, taking on responsibilities because marriage involves a lot of responsibilities. What could be more conservative than that? With a conservative value. <laughs> And, 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 the, and the fact that, that, that this country is founded on the ideal of we're all created equal. We say that over again from the Declaration of Independence to, the, to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address to the 14th Amendment, and we say it in our court decisions. Well, why aren't we living that? Um, 
And so I felt very strongly, and you mentioned the name. People have said that thing. Yeah. You, could, you could let these people do whatever they want. They can share their property. They can have joint tax returns and so forth. Let it call, it, call it a civil union or something. But no one celebrates the anniversary of their civil union. Um, yeah. <laughs> no one, no one, no, it, it, it is a different thing, even our opponents, because they said marriage is so special, you shouldn't have it. The, this this <laughs> didn't make any sense, and, and I tried to figure out how best to, to, how best to express that to a court, because I, I was actually, knowing that I was going to be asked it somehow every place, and I was asked it over and over in court, including the United States Supreme Court, and the, um, that what I said was, uh, what I came up with this is that, um, what if you were allowed to travel, vote, participate in democracy? Um, you could have all those things, but you uh, can never call yourself a citizen of the United States. Everyone would know that was second rate. You were not a part of the community, even though you could do all those things. Well, marriage is very much like that. People respect the institution of marriage. People bond together. Uh, and it's a part of a very important institution. The Supreme Court has said 14 times that it's a fundamental right, maybe the most fundamental right that we have. And so the, the word does mean a lot. So David, a lot of progressive leaders, particularly in the LGBT community, were not with you guys. They felt we needed an incremental approach. We had made great progress domestic partnerships. Uh, we were making great progress with civil unions that it was too much, too soon, too fast, and God forbid the two of you partner together and fail to achieve your goal, you'll set back the movement for 20 years. Yeah. And, and those were views that, that we took very seriously, um, in, in part because they were held by people who had devoted a lot more of their time and their lives and their effort uh, to this struggle than we had. Uh, they were people that were much more experienced uh, with some of these issues than we were. Um, I remember uh, a professor at Yale uh, wrote an article in 2009 saying that the odds uh, were long against us, yep. uh, that we would probably fail, and that in failing we would set back um, the movement. Uh, but we ultimately concluded that this was the right case at the right time. We were the right people to, to bring it for several reasons. First, as a practical matter, we thought somebody was going to bring sure. this law lawsuit. Sure. A lot of people in California wanted to get married. There are a lot of lawyers in California. <laughs> and, um, and we suspected that they would find somebody to bring that lawsuit. Yeah. And so the issue was not so much, is there going to be a lawsuit? But the question is, who's going to bring it? And if you're going to bring this kind of lawsuit, you want to win it. And in order to win it, you want to prepare it and try it as best you can. Uh, Ted and I had a lot of experience uh, trying lawsuits. Um, in addition, we each brought with us the resources of our firm. Um, this is not an individual effort. This is a team sport. And uh, we had more than 50 other lawyers and paralegals from our two firms working on this case, in many cases night and day. And the ability for us to marshal the resources on this case, which we knew was going to be heavily defended, um, was, was something that was very important. So we felt we had the resources, we had the experience uh, to really prepare the case well. The second thing was that we looked at the Supreme Court opinions. Uh, we looked uh, in particular at an opinion in Lawrence against Texas. Right. Now this is the one year anniversary of our victory and of the Windsor Court victory. But it's the 11th year anniversary to the day of Lawrence against Texas, which was the first case in which the United States Supreme Court held that the Equal Protection and Due Process Clause protections of the United States Constitution protected gay and lesbian citizens from discrimination. Now, the particular issue in that case was simply whether state laws could criminalize intimate gay and lesbian conduct. But the reasoning of that case was very broad. And it was written by Justice Kennedy. And it essentially said, these are citizens like everyone else. They are entitled to the pursuit of happiness like everyone else. 
you cannot discriminate against them because you disagree with them on the basis of morality or religious <laughs> principles. And Justice Scalia, in dissent, 11 years ago, said, it's over. He said, this, is a, this court decision has just dismantled every constitutional principle that permitted states to distinguish between heterosexuals and homosexuals with respect to marriage. And we think he was right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and there was an, another opinion after that, Romer against Colorado, also right. written by uh, Justice Kennedy. Yeah, Kennedy. Yeah. Um, and, and we felt that there was a majority on the court. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we felt there was a majority on the Supreme Court. We felt we, 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 felt we could win this case. Um, the, the third uh, reason that we went ahead. Hey David, I'm sorry to cut you off. I mean, sure. so really, at the end of the day, you, you really look to Kennedy as the key decision, particularly with Romer. Uh, being more contemporary, and then looking back at, uh, at that Scalia dissent as prescient. He, he was, he, he was we, we, didn't want, we didn't give up on any justice. Um, uh, we frankly had some uh, hopes, uh, serious hopes, of getting at least a couple of the justices right. we didn't get. Um, uh, but uh, we, felt, we felt secure um, that with Kennedy, and we thought Kennedy's opinion in Lawrence and Romer was so strong. Yeah that we really uh, felt that this was a case that we would, we would prevail. We also thought that when we got to the Supreme Court, uh, we'd have a number of different ways to win. Right. Um, uh, we, we felt good about winning this in the federal district court here. We felt good about winning it in the Ninth Circuit. Um, we didn't know, but we thought there was a good chance that the governor and attorney general would not appeal. And we thought if they didn't, uh, the proponents of the proposition would not have standing right. to appeal. And so that uh, in addition to winning it on the merits in the Supreme Court, we could win it on the grounds that the proponents didn't have standing to attack what we thought would be a victory in the district court and court of appeals. So there were a lot of different ways that we could get home. And I think that we thought that with all of those, uh, we had a very good chance of invalidating Proposition 8. Right. Um, we, also, we also thought that the process of the trial and the process that we could bring to the table in terms of discussing this issue was something that we could bring what had been an, an issue that really had not gotten as much mainstream attention as it deserved we could help get that into the mainstream of America. Yeah. Um, uh, Ted wrote a cover story in Newsweek magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote an op-ed piece in the Wall, Wall Street Journal. Yeah. Uh, we were on television. When we brought the case, it was front page news in the uh, New York Times and across the country. Um, we were able to speak to the American people in part because of our odd couple uh, status. I, I, I analogize in one case to the bearded lady in the circus tent that brings you into the tent and then they try to sell you something. And, um, uh, but, but Dave's, David's still working on a better metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's that, uh, yeah. but, it's, uh, but we did bring them in. We did, we, 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 we did bring them in and we did get a chance to talk to them. And, and we were convinced that if we could talk to them, we would be able to change people's minds. Uh, this is not a case in which I think if you sit down with people and have a chance to talk to them, there are two ways that you can come out. Um, I, I think I'm pretty good at figuring out what the best argument is on the other side. Uh, as a trial lawyer, you have to do that. You want to know how to meet it. If you can't meet it, you want to know how to obscure it. Um, uh, but you, want to, you, need to, you need to be able to know what the other side's going to argue in order to deal with it. This was a situation in which there wasn't 
a substantive argument on the other side. They had a bumper sticker. Right. Marriage between a man and a woman. That's, yeah. not, that's not an analysis. That's the conclusion. Um, there, was, there, was no, there was no legal precedent there. There was no policy there. There was no justification there. Um, uh, and I believe in the basic fairness of the American people. There's always going to be a fringe that you're not going to get. Um, uh, I, I said the other day that you know, a certain percentage of the American people still think the world is flat. And um, so there's always a f fringe you're not going to get. But I was convinced that we could convince the vast majority of American people if we could just get them to pay attention to this issue. And I thought we could, and I thought that would change the character of the debate. So it was, it was so you had two challenges. One, you had to win in court, but you had to change the proverbial court of public opinion. Exactly. And with that, you had a strategy then that you attached to this early on. But there was a lot of controversy around that strategy, i.e., there were some that were asserting that you were interested in moving the case through motions, not necessarily a trial early on. Uh, eventually, it went to trial, and Judge Walker. Uh, what was the machinations of those discussions? Were those overplayed? Was it always a trial that you were after? And were you disappointed as a consequence, extension of, of David's point, when it was not allowed to be televised? We, well, let me. The first part of it was we, when we filed this case, we thought uh, most of these cases, civil rights cases, have been brought. People file a case and then there's motions, you know, and the judge looks at the arguments on either side and can decide the case. And then you're, you're on a faster track. You're on to the Court of Appeals right. uh, and then you're maybe on to the Supreme Court. So initially, we, both sides, even the, our opponents, thought that this was a case that could be handled on the form of motions. We were assigned to Chief Judge Walker in this case, um, um, and, and it was, turned out to be very, very fortunate because he is a trial lawyer, or has been, he's resigned uh, by now, but he, he spent 20-some years in a trial court, and he said to us when we came before him early in the case, I'm a trial court. It's how we do this is more important than the decision because the decision is going to be made at a higher level someday. He said, I want a trial. I want to hear evidence on marriage, on psychology, on raising children, on the politics of this, um, on the characteristics, on the impact of discrimination. I want a trial. I'll give you a trial quickly. He said this, this was the summer, we filed it in May, this was July or August. He said, I'll give you a trial in January, but I want a trial. Um, so that wasn't exactly what we had in the mind at the beginning, but we embraced that because that would give us an opportunity to put on trial discrimination and the impact of discrimination and the harm that's done. All of these things, now, we didn't foresee everything. But we did think this was a great opportunity. We thought we had the resources to find the best experts in the world. And our opponents complained bitterly about the schedule. We don't have time to do this. We don't have time to get experts, to do expert reports, to take depositions, still get to trial. And we kept saying, we're going to stand on that schedule and we'll do whatever it takes to get there. So we were very happy about that. Once the judge had decided that's what we wanted to do, we embraced it. The judge decided that this is an important constitutional question involving tens of thousands, ultimately millions of people in the United States. And then the people sh can't get into the courtroom. They should be in the courtroom because there should be a, a streaming of the trial outside to the public. We thought that was fantastic. Our opponents hated the idea. And maybe, <laughs> uh, and, and you know, it tells you a lot. Uh, yeah. uh, a lot that we thought they were complaining bitterly there's going to be a trial and and then and the public is going to be coming into the trial what could be more american than a trial um <laughs> a, a, a real back and forth evidence goes on people would testify and be cross-examined and things like that and the american people should see this if you don't want the american people to see what's going on in that courtroom. What's the matter with your ideas? Mm -hmm. you know, is there something wrong about your side of this case if you don't want people to see it? Ultimately, um, because I know you've got a lot to cover, the Supreme Court stopped the idea of televising the trial outside the courtroom on the first day of the trial. But the cameras stayed in the courtroom. That, that tape still exists, yeah, yeah. it's still, no one's seen it. But in a way, that was a benefit too, because um, 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 
Lance Black, the, the playwright, took pieces of, the, the screenwriter took pieces of the trial and made it into a play called Eight, which has been performed all over the country, so people have seen it. Um, HBO followed us with cameras everywhere, and except for, the, in, to some degree, the courtroom, and they made this fabulous documentary which came out earlier this week called The Case Against Eight, and if you haven't seen it, for heaven's sakes, see it, it will tear you to pieces. It's yeah. so beautifully done. Um, and so that, and then, and it also gave us an opportunity to write a book, <laughs> 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 which, which we want to talk about, but the, the um, <laughs> no, but what the, the story of this case is told, uh, we still think that the American people should see the trial uh, because it's so important, but uh, there are other ways in which in, including events like this uh, that can give the American people an insight in the, into the case. Well, you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. Today we're discussing the future of marriage equality in the United States with noted attorneys David Boyes and Ted Olson, who won the Supreme Court decision striking down California's Prop 8. I'm Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, and you can also find a video extension of the narrative here of Commonwealth Club programs online <laughs> at the club's YouTube channel, Redeeming the Dream. David, you have a long history of civil rights. You were there in Mississippi when it mattered. Um, redeeming the dream means a lot to a lot of people. Uh, what was the impetus of thinking behind the title of the book? It, it, it was obviously, um, to some extent, related to Martin Luther King's dream of equality. It was also related to the dream that was spawned here in California um, when gay and le lesbian citizens were given the right to get married, and they did get married, and they by did the California by the California Supreme Court in May of 2008, um, and then that dream was taken away from them uh, by Proposition 8, and so our attack on Proposition 8 was a way of trying to redeem that dream of equality that people had and had experienced in California, and one of the arguments that we made is that you could not, consistent with due process and equal protection, take that right away. Right. So what, in the process of putting a book together like this, I mean, there's been, you know, we've had now the, the documentaries come out, the plays come out. Um, we all, many of us in this room certainly, but the country lived through this process. We, extraordinary what's happened just in the last 60 days. Uh, I was just looking at Arkansas, Idaho, okay. Oregon, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Utah, Indiana. That's all since May federal judges opining on this, just since May, not of last year, last month. Uh, we <laughs> reached a remarkable tipping point. Uh, so when you're putting this book together, what were you trying to achieve? I mean, it's an inside story of your experience, of, of the, the sort of application and inspiration. Um, what, what would we, what's the takeaway with the book? What, what can we learn? from this book well, uniquely in the I state. should mention also Joe Becker, New York Times uh, award-winning writer, also followed us through this case right. and, and wrote a book called Forcing the Spring, which came out a month or two ago, and it's a beautiful book. What David and I were trying to achieve is a couple of things. We wanted to tell the story of how we structured our strategy. Um, this is something that is important to the extent that people can learn by our mistakes and by our successes with respect to what we were thinking, why we put it together. Um, we wanted to teach people about what we had learned about ourselves, about our country, about discrimination. The trial itself was a tremendous eye-opener about all of these so many fascinating things. And we learned a lot. We wanted to share our feelings with the American people in the form of a book. And you have to put that in writing and give people a chance to do it, and we wanted to tell the story, and the movie does it better than we could do it, but we wanted to tell the story of the plaintiffs, Chris and Sandy, and Jeff and Paul, how much we grew to love them, um, how much their passion, their commitment, their dedication, and their telling their story in court, and taking on the burden of being plaintiffs in a civil rights lawsuit that took so long, that's had ups and downs, and. Um, tension and excitement, and it takes a lot out of you to do that and to be put in the spotlight. We wanted to tell the story the best we could from our perspective 
uh, of, of those individuals and what they went through and how they made the case with their testimony, with their, uh, their life story. And so all of those things, I'm not so sure we accomplished all of those things in the, in the in, 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 you know, as good as we could, but we did it the best we could because we felt that this was something that would meant so much to us, we had to put it in writing and make it permanent. David, I imagine this had to change you pretty profoundly. The experiences, people coming up to you. Uh, I mean, this is not an ab, I mean, so much of your work, and I don't mean to diminish the other work, but it's more academic, uh, theoretical. But you're arguing here, but when you got deeper into this, I imagine uh, there were layers of this that you never could have seen coming that must have moved you profoundly. There, re there really were. Um, when we started, I think both Ted and I were committed to this as a matter of constitutional principle, as a matter of basic fairness, as a ma matter of constitutional law. Um, but as we got into the case and as we got to know our plaintiffs and as we began to identify them, and I've said many times before that they started out as our clients and they became our friends and they ended up our family. And we shared their pain. We shared uh, the damage that the discrimination did. We moved from a intellectual uh, case, about which we felt passionately even in the beginning, to a highly emotional case where we've, we felt that our future and the future of our families were tied up in what happened in this case. And that's, that's only increased as time has gone on and as we see and we talk to every day uh, people whose lives have been changed, uh, not just by what we've done, but by what all of the people who have devoted so much time and effort uh, to achieving equality over the last several decades uh, have worked to do. And it has been, I think, for Ted and myself, uh, the most satisfying case that we've ever been, been involved in. And Ted, for you particularly, not without consequences. I mean, Rush Limbaugh. I know, it's, a, you see, that just, yeah, it's not a punchline. Doesn't like uh, I was gonna, or a comma. Doesn't but I mean, like me anymore. Yeah, no, I mean, but you know, yeah, he said, right away, he said, you were one of us. This notion of betrayal. Uh, I imagine that, I mean, he amplified it as he often does, verbosely, but others, I imagine, quietly, uh, folks that you were very close to, people you admired, uh, that animus probably still remains. That, I mean, is this cost you professionally? Have you been able to repair those relationships? Have you been able to uh, convince them of the merits of your argument? What, what's, I mean, in a broader sense, how has it impacted you even, not just personally, which I'd love to hear, but also professionally? Well, I don't worry about things like that. I really don't. Um, the, there have been some people that didn't understand, that did disagree. Uh, I looked upon that in large part as an opportunity to explain why I felt that David mentioned the article. I wrote the article uh, for Newsweek about the conservative case for gay marriage. I figured that this was an opportunity. I have deep convictions about the rightness of this. Um, it's only reinforced every time I look at Chris and Sandy uh, or Jeff and Paul, but I knew that this was right. Um, and I knew that I wouldn't really, if given the opportunity, to do something about it, and if I walked away from it because other people didn't think that it was the right thing to do or that I would become unpopular, I would not really be able to live with myself. Um, this is something that is exceedingly important. And yes, the, uh, you get some emails or this, that, that sort of thing and so forth, but we're overwhelmed by the good feeling that comes out of people walking past me on a, sitting in an airplane and doing like this. Yeah, yeah, so. um, and the, and the, things that, the things that we hear last night here um, at the LGBT Community Center just up the road um, on Market Street, we were with 125 or so people uh, that talked about with us about their experiences um, and it was extraordinarily gratifying. Not a moment really or a day goes by without us um, hearing from somebody that, that uh, we may have touched in a small way. That 
completely eclipses any professional or personal. Right. Um, Amen. Amen. What yeah, I agree. Uh, <laughs> did you choose the plaintiffs, or did the plaintiffs choose you? It was a combination. Um, one of the things that uh, the plaintiffs had to be uh, satisfied with is the case that we were going to bring and how we were going to represent them. But one of the things we also had to be sure of is that we were able to identify plaintiffs that were going to have the strength of character and the staying power and the courage, really, to go through what was, we knew was going to be an arduous process. Um, we knew that this was a process that was going to take years, not months. Uh, we, we knew that we needed to have people who had a commitment to their relationship so that that relationship could withstand that time and that pressure. Um, we need to had, needed to have people whose families would accept and support um, the difficulties that they would have to go through. We needed to have people who had the inner character and the strength to be able to endure what we knew was going to be a lot of harassment, um, a lot of attacks, uh, a lot of vile kind of things um, that they were, they were subjected to. You would not want to play in a family audience uh, some of the things that were messages that were left on their answering machines. And we needed to have people who would stick with it through that. And we found in, in our four plaintiffs, um, Chris and Standy and Jeff and Paul, four extraordinary human beings who were able with intelligence and humor to describe our case and describe what they felt, describe why this was an important issue, describe what they were being deprived of by the discrimination and how that had hurt them and damaged them, but also to describe the kind of higher arc that they and others could have if this discrimination were eliminated. Uh, Ted and I have often said that the best argument that we could ever make is, would be just to play the testimony of Chris and Sandy and Jeff and Paul that they gave. Uh, we called them, the four of them, as our first witnesses. And those of you who are lawyers in the audience know that you don't generally do that. That's a, that's a dangerous thing to do. Because if they don't come across perfectly, you may have lost a momentum that you never recover in the trial. And so it was a, in some senses, some people would say it was a risky uh, strategy to put them on first. But we felt it was important to put a human face on this discrimination and to have the judge listen to real people describe in real terms what this case was about. And there was not a dry eye in the courtroom. And I include the people on the other side. I include the lawyers on the other side um, listening to that testimony. And you'll get a sense of it in this HBO documentary. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't come across with as much dramatic impact as the trial did, but it comes across with a lot of dramatic impact. And I don't believe that you can watch that documentary, and I don't believe you could have listened to the plaintiffs in our trial, no matter what your going in position was, and not end up rooting for them. Yeah. And, that, and that was, I think, our most powerful evidence, and it was something that was, it was critical for us to find the right people to do that, the people who would be able to carry that message and carry it in a sustained way. Well, we're blessed to have Chris and Sandy here. Uh, and I know we put a mic very close to you. I love it. Uh, you don't get off uh, without you know, participating. Uh, would you guys like to, to say anything? Um, and first of all, thank you so much for taking the time here. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for stepping up. What, well, I mean, to both of you, either of you, I mean, <laughs> this is a pretty impressive team you got behind you. Uh, about as good as it gets. It is as good as it gets. What was it like 
a year ago today uh, when that decision came down? What did it mean to you personally, your family, uh, and what did it mean in terms of the narrative, the, the, the years uh, that you struggled and participated in this process? What, 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 what sort of sense of validation or purposefulness did you have? Happy anniversary, Ted and David, <laughs> <laughs> number one. And um, the day a year ago, June 26, 2013, I actually thought about you, Lieutenant Governor Newsom, and what Sandy and I did because of you 10 years earlier. We ran to San Francisco City Hall. We were married and couldn't have been more overjoyed. And then a few months later, that was taken away. And we were so aggrieved by that that we didn't take advantage of the six-month window in 2008. Yeah. We didn't go get married again. It was too hard. We had four boys. They were put through it once. We didn't do it again. So when Ted and David went into this with a new strategy where they were going to seek federal remedies to this problem, we thought, well, maybe that was the permanent solution that would let Sandy and I get married. So the rest is history. We know that happened. On that day, I was really thinking of the 10-year span that you started in San Francisco, that we won a trial in San Francisco. We came back to San Francisco, and two days later, we were married in City Hall by Kamala Harris, with so many people celebrating along with us, and we could almost predict that that moment was coming and that everyone would be as celebratory and overjoyed with what had been accomplished by not just the three of you, but this entire city, this state, this court system, so many people, and we couldn't be more proud to be a part of everything everybody did, including you. So I know that Sandy and I couldn't ask for a better place to be tonight on our first SCOTUS anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound so great, but you know, now we have that too. Thank you, Chris. Thank you guys again for being here. I, I, let me pick up a little bit on that. You know. Um, you look back, the history of the rights movement, um, it is the courts that intervene. Uh, the, the whims of the minority are always tend to be suppressed by the majority, and that certainly was the case in the Loving versus Virginia decision. 1967, for those that forget, forget blacks couldn't marry whites in 16 states in 1967, the backdrop was 70% of Americans, roughly 70% of Americans opposed interracial marriage, and it was that activist court, the Supreme Court, unanimously overturned those laws denying interracial marriage. Is that the same narrative? Is that the same um, course of history that we're now entering upon? I mean, we, we've got 44% of Americans uh, that now live in states where we have legal uh, sanctioned same-sex marriage. We have potentially going from 19 to 26, depending on the adjudication of all these appeals and stays, 26 of our 50 states that provide for it. But you still have outliers. I mean, we've had seven state legislatures that are passing legislation uh, trying to deny gay and lesbians uh, from being served for religious reasons uh, in some state legislature. You had Rick Perry was here just a couple weeks ago at the Commonwealth Club, right. who made some statements. You, <laughs> yeah. you got folks out there that are still believing in reparative therapy and the like. I mean, there's an enormous amount of work still to be done. So what's your sense of where we're going? We had the big decision yesterday um, in one of uh, the Tenth Circuit, uh, the work you guys are doing in Virginia, which uh, potentially uh, hopefully all this comes together, Supreme Court. Where are we going? We believe that with what has been already been said, 14 consecutive federal district judges reading the Windsor decision, yep. reading Judge Walker's fabulous opinion, and putting that together and coming what, from what they see as an inexorable conclusion that this form of discrimination is unconstitutional. It violates the Equal Protection Clause and the Due Process Clause. I don't know of any circumstance in history where 14 separate federal judges appointed by different presidents in all parts of the country have come to the same conclusion. And I've read those opinions. They're 30, 40, 50 page opinions in their own words expressing the same thing. Then yesterday, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals approved the Utah decision. Um, our case was argued in the Virginia case. We won that in the district court. That was argued in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals on May 12th. 
We expect a decision any time from that Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. It is inevitable that the United States Supreme Court will have to deal with this case, because you're right, there are outliers. There are probably going to be some district court decisions or circuit court decisions that go the other way. But the, but the fact is, you've got 43% of people living in states with marriage equality now. Um, some of these other states will come aboard. But then you have people, you move from Maryland to Virginia, for example. What happens to your children? What happens to your property? What happens to your rights? We cannot live in this country with a, a patchwork of laws that treat people differently. I was looking at the Ohio statute, which is as bad as the Virginia statute, because it says not only is marriage only between a man and a woman, but there are no civil unions. Those are void. Um, those won't be recognized. And any contractual relationship between two persons of the same sex that approximates the effect or appearance of marriage is, un, is illegal and it's void. So what happens to those relationships that when people move, and we pride ourselves in this country of being mobile and flexible and going from place to place, it's intolerable. So the Supreme Court of the United States has got to take this case, and if it takes the Tenth Circuit case or it takes the Fourth Circuit case, I think it's gonna happen sooner rather than later. My prediction, and David's too, is that it's going to happen in the next term of the Supreme Court, they're going to be done on Monday with the last cataclysmic decision. They made some <laughs> big ones today. On the last two, which includes this Hobby Lobby case, which, yes. is, which involves nice. the issue that you're talking about, but they're done until they come back on the first Monday in October. And I think that's when their term starts. I think this issue will come before them next term or certainly the term after that. And we may have and on the anniversary again, another decision. <laughs> I, I, I am an optimist, um, a bit of a Pollyanna when it comes to this issue, we, and David is the same way. We believe so strongly that there's only one outcome, uh, that we will get there, and people in this country, Loving versus Virginia, 1967, now people, we talked to journalists, serious adult people, said that was never the law, was it? That <laughs> The president's mother and father, yeah, if they'd have been in Virginia, they would have been guilty of a felony you know, yeah. in, in, until that Supreme Court decision. Now people say, of course, that's, that's nonsense. This is, that's not a You matter. remember the, the judge in the lower court decision just briefly said, I'll never forget on religious grounds, and there are a number of questions. It's a segue to some of your questions. Uh, said, and I'll paraphrase, but this is roughly what he said. He said, God, sir, God put different races on different continents for a reason. God never wanted the races to mix. Yeah. Sentencing Richard Loving, married Mildred Jeter, to one year. Uh, had to leave the state or one year in jail. Extraordinary, religious grounds. Again, with the backdrop of 70% of Americans saying, amen, what a wonderful decision. That said, what about the religious arguments? What about, uh, there's a number of questions from all of you about religious arguments. Uh, and in an extension of that, what is the best argument? There's a question simply here. What is the best argument from your perspective against same-sex marriage? Is it a religious argument? Is it an argument based on some form of tradition or that well, government shouldn't be in this business at all? Well, first, first, first of all, the, the courts have been consistent. The tradition is not a justification for discrimination. Um, if tradition were a justification for discrimination, uh, women still wouldn't vote. They couldn't. Uh, have any equal rights in uh, marriage. Uh, African Americans couldn't go to school with whites. You couldn't have interracial marriage. Uh, tradition cannot be a justification uh, for, for continued discrimination. Um, with respect to the best argument against it, it depends what you mean. Um, there are people who believe as a sincere article of faith, dogma of their religion, that marriage and sex ought to be limited to people of the opposite sex. Now, as you pointed out, there were people who believed as a matter of religious dogma that uh, marriage and sex should be limited to people of the same race. And uh, people can have a variety of uh, religious views and they can hold those very sincerely. And the First Amendment of the Constitution guarantees the freedom of everyone to have the religious beliefs that they do. But the First Amendment also, in its separation of church and state, guarantees that no religion 
and no a majoritarian um, religious belief can infringe on the rights of minorities. And so can there be a religious argument against uh, marriage equality? Yes, there can. But can there be a religious argument for the government limiting marriage to people of the opposite sex? No. There simply is not a policy, there's not a secular policy, there's not a constitutional policy, there's not a constitutional precedent that permits you to take religious views that you may hold sincerely, that a majority of the people may hold sincerely, and impose them on somebody else. Yeah. We're down to... <laughs> we, um, we're down just to, to a few minutes, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to we'll do a bit of a lightning round here. I'll, I'll spare you the questions. Thank you all about the NSA Snowden questions, the legalizing marijuana questions, the voting rights questions. And, uh, I'm, yeah, that's all. That, we'll need another two or three hours. Uh, uh, just know that they were all included. I'm happy to provide them for you. Uh, uh, what, but there, there's a theme in here as I'm reading through the questions about a sense, in this room at least, of a bias with the current uh, Supreme Court, a bias to the right. Now, you've, you've argued 60 cases in front of them. I imagine you have many more left in you. I, I imagine you, you don't want to answer um, that too overtly. Uh, so, they, well, David, you too, but I'm going to ask you first. Um, as a fellow progressive, do you, do you think there's a bit of a bias? I think uh, the Supreme Court is, in uh, many respects, uh, much more uh, conservative uh, than I am and that I would like to see the court to be. Uh, on the other hand, um, I think that uh, the court has also um, had a series of decisions respecting uh, people's equal dignity and equal rights and, and trying to continue the preservation and advancement of those. Um, I, was, uh, I was deeply disappointed to see what I consider to be the most activist court decision that I've seen in a long time when the Supreme Court struck down the voting rights uh, provisions that um, uh, had, been, had been passed uh, essentially unanimously um, by, by Congress. And I think that uh, the interpretation of um, when people can sue uh, for uh, discriminatory conduct uh, limitations on um, um, various kind of environmental regulations are all uh, areas in which I think the, the court is, is, is quite conservative. I, I think that the court is struggling to try to reach a balance um, between uh, activism and non-activism, if that's a word. Um, which is not the same as conservative and liberal. You can have a very activist court serving liberal goals, um, uh, as you did in perhaps Brown against Board of Education. Um, you can also have a very activist court serving conservative goals, um, uh, as, for example, when the court uh, overturns the Voting Rights Act. Um, so activism is not the province of either liberals or conservatives. And I think that what is less important than how conservative or liberal the court is, is how activist the court is going to be. And I think the court is working its way through that. Um, uh, I think the election um, uh, in 2016, uh, particularly if the whoever's elected is, uh, serves two terms, is going to be critical for the court. Um, that president is going to determine the direction of the court for perhaps 20, 30 years or more. Yeah. Uh, so I think that uh, you've got a court that while I think is tilting um, more conservative than, I, than I'd like to see it, it is a court that's still quite in balance on a lot of issues. And the balance is very close 
A lot of these decisions are 5-4. Um, the court uh, makes a lot of unanimous decisions, but on these critical social issues, um, they, often, they often divide 5-4. And so the appointment process is going to be something that's going to be extremely important to the to the future of the court and the future of the country. You're here. Well, our, our time is, is up, and, and let me, I, I want to sort of summarize a, a final question. I, you know, getting the flavor of these questions, I think there's a sense and a sentiment of admiration and appreciation for your willingness to work together as you have beyond your differences, and, and a sense of frustration as I read these questions of the lack of that spirit, particularly in Washington, D.C. Um, and, and so it, it begged a number of questions about what's next for you two. Um, there's sort of a hopefulness that you'll continue down this course of example, that it's not just limited to marriage equality. And so, final question, um, has this been an experience that's ennobled you, uh, and is it uh, an experience that we uh, can look forward uh, to seeing in the future? Yes, we're, we're, it has ennobled us. Um, it has enriched us. Uh, it's inspired us. Um, we realize the power of the certain degree of celebrity. We, whether we deserve it or not, there we are. Um, and we've worked together for a couple years leading an ABA American Bar Association task force to uh, support more funding for the courts all across the country. Because if you starve the courts, you starve people's civil liberties and their, and their criminal justice system. And the people who most need justice are deprived of it most quickly. So we've worked together on that. We've worked together on other things. We're thinking about working on, we're, we're doing the Virginia case. We're thinking, my firm's involved in this education case in California. We're thinking that we, you know, David in New York and so forth. We will work together. We will take advantage of the fact that people will pay attention to us to try to do some good with that. Um, we will occasionally wind up on opposite sides when it's necessary to make some money for our law firms. <laughs> but, but, but the fact is that I think that we can talk about, the fact that we're talking about it here, uh, and the fact that as members of the profession that we so respect, I think we can lead a little bit by example by saying you, you can be friends and you can have great admiration for your opponent in the courtroom. Uh, and that you can work together. Surely there are things that you can find to do together that you agree upon that maybe you can bring other people along with. So it is, it is important, but we're not ignorant of the fact that maybe we have a chance to do some good. And we'll be watched very carefully if we don't do some good. Uh, if, we make, if we do stupid things, we're going to get caught because we can't get away under a veil of anonymity anymore. <laughs> and I, I, I would predict that one of the important civil rights uh, that we will be focusing on will be education. Because I think that education, Is a, basic, is a basic civil right. And we don't um, tell people that whether you get fire protection or police protection depends on how much money you make or where your parents live. But we tell people that the education that you get depends on where your parents live and how much money they make. And uh, that's not a way to dispense basic civil rights. Well, a wonderful way to end. Thank you to our guests. We thank our audience here in radio, television, internet. We want to remind everyone that there are copies of our speakers' books right behind you. And they are available to sign your books. Please allow them the opportunity to make their way to get to the books so they can get home by 1 or 2 in the morning. Uh, I think they want us over here. And buy the books. Take your time and read it. And I want to just say on behalf of a grateful state and personally how grateful I am to two of you for your example, for um, your living legacy uh, on behalf of all of us. I'm Lieutenant Governor Gavin Newsom, and now the meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. The place to be in the know has now ended. Thank you, sir. You're very good. Very good. Very good.